Welcome uh, everybody to the next talk. We're going to be uh, continuing on in kind of the education theme and talking. Uh, Cass is going to be talking about lessons learned on education during uh, the COVID craziness. So take yeah. it away. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, hey everyone. So my name is Cass Wilkinson Saldana. Uh, I'm a data science educator at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I use they them pronouns. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about kind of data learning strategy in complex institutions like many of us work in. Uh, and you also hear some specific call outs and also thematic riffs from other things that we've heard over the course of the last two days. So this is me, uh, hi, and this is my cat, Jane, uh, just looking cute. Um, so by training, I am a data librarian and I'm also a mixed methods researcher. So my work kind of blurs together the worlds of social science, data science, and education. Uh, I work with learners who find their way to data science, and sometimes their path to data science is very clear, it's very, it's very enthusiastic, it's uh, maybe they have their time marked off to work towards this goal, they might have a background in something similar to data science. But honestly, for the vast majority of us, right, we kind of kind of come into data science maybe a little bit sideways, maybe tentatively, uh, you know, we might wander in a little skeptically or nervously. Maybe we follow a trusted friend or colleague into a particular um, set of methods. But at some point, you know, we make this hop and we let ourselves be vulnerable. Um, so here at CHOP, you know, I, I work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. We call it CHOP. Uh, you know, I work with this wonderful, diverse group of uh, research data managers, clinicians, analysts, engineers. Uh, people who would want to, you know, would like to deepen their toolbox with data and open science. And so our program is called ARCUS, and it's part of the Department of Biomedical and Health Informatics. Uh, it's an initiative to, as he says here, link clinical and research data to accelerate science. So we're educators, you know, this unit within ARCUS, and our goal is to really support, you know, training, guidance, resources around data. Um, and we are sort of, uh, our mandate is kind of this idea almost of culture change of really trying to help people share their data and feel comfortable. And I really, um, I did find earlier what we heard about this idea of the, the goal of sharing and how that can play out in, in institutions where there might be um, interest, but some kind of cultural, logistic, privacy resistance to that. So that's kind of a bit of what we, what we do. And so while we, uh, we do certainly work with folks who are deep into their machine learning uh, practice and journeys, right? A lot of times we're working with people who are making some type of hop. I would argue that all of us are making some kind of hop into either the first or the next step in, in data learning. So, um, you know, so for folks who are, have made it here uh, to this R conference, or wherever, whenever, whenever you're watching this, uh, you know, you've likely begun to see that when you have an experience like this, with code like this, uh, it's difficult, it's of course, uh, um, but you know, this is also the context where we sort of have learned that this is when we reach out to people. And in fact, um, you know, whether it's a Google search or a forum post or, um, you know, a Slack or talking to somebody in person, um, these are actually some of the moments where I would argue that we feel the most connected as communities is when we kind of can reach out and say, hey, I have this question, I have this approach. So we're very practiced in dealing with this kind of moment. But for, for newcomers, this can be very deflating. So I think it's always important to come back to and remember, even now, I like this, this is just flat out console output. Uh, or rather, you know, this is from from uh, our console kind of, you, you can see the output and you can kind of feel it, right? Still those error messages. Um, and, you know, we also are folks who, uh, when we hear a new, that new method, it just gets us excited, right? So I was really excited earlier when we heard about uh, Train Lee's uh, tree heater package. My immediate thought was, oh, I was stuck for so long on this one part of a product in grad school. This would have been perfect. So my, my mental model was like, oh, interpretable, machine learning visualized in a way that you can explain and tease out, like this fits right into that. But again, for folks without that mental model, uh, it might be harder to integrate some of this information. Um, so uh, as an educator, my task is often to help people basically get to the point where they can bridge some of these moments uh, to uh, of not knowing and feeling vulnerable to some kind of actual community building around that. 
Um, so this is uh, myself when I was working on an, um, using the learner package for a project with my colleagues here. Uh, and I needed to find a way to test uh, code that could run in both Python and R, uh, where it would run in both, but the result would be different. Um, I knew, you know, I had the the, uh, the strategic cheat sheet of being an educator, of course, but uh, I knew that this was the perfect time to reach out to um, the uh, Slack community, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, and get some great, you know, this was a really fun way to reach out. I, I loved, I think I got to know Paul a little better through this and other uh, other folks here at, at CHOP, and that was a really nice thing. So, you know, I'm going to really focus for the rest of my time here on this question, these two questions, right? So. How do we help a learner's uh, leap into, into data science, uh, lead to persistence and belonging? Um, and then also, how do we sustain learning, growth, and careers? And I'm specific about those things, not just learning, but learning, growth, and careers within complex institutions, right? So I'm going to kind of give you some reflections from our experience, and hopefully uh, it might give you some new ways to think about some of these concepts that um, probably uh, are important to you in different ways. So, you know, one is community practice, which we hear about a lot and is very important. And I will, for a moment, uh, bring us back. I, I wrote this and I was like, oh no, bringing us back to February 2020 is kind of tragic, right? Uh, that, that, that missing in-person instruction is, 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 is hard. Um, but, um, you know, so this was part of our mode over the winter, uh, kind of a, a sense of what it meant to be doing data, data education, data learning within our particular part of the universe of, of, of data work, of, of research. Um, so our little ecosystem at CHOP is basically this, this kind of overlapping communities of practice. And so this was part of uh, Arcus um, data education. One of the things that I have done is sort of develop and lead workshops like this is a machine learning workshop uh, that we led in collaboration with this great group called MetaChop that is kind of cross institutional. And uh, some of the things that I, you know, will draw attention to, to here is being able to get people together in a room. I love the technique of having small groups. So I think that um, you know, in Stefan's 101, in the 101 session we had on Thursday, uh, there was a similar concept of small affinity groups. I think that kind of thing is really important. I also love giving people coffee and food. So that's something we did here. But this is one modality that we had. And when we work, we also find ways to cross promote and work within other groups. Um, so you see here are some of my Slack notifications around um, my department, DBHI, and then also the CHOPR and the Python user groups. These are um, amazing, really wonderful groups. A lot of folks here are parts of those groups that you've heard from from CHOP. Um, and so they're really gathering points in, in a context where people can focus intensively on a language and learn kind of what other folks are doing within the hospital uh, with those languages. So this is, you probably are familiar with these different, uh, having a very full Slack slate, right? Uh, it's a really wonderful thing. and. And to give you a sense of what the world looked like in the winter, our cadence was there would probably be maybe about one or two bigger events a month that are in person, and then some regular series with, uh, you know, using R, using statistics. So that was kind of um, the cadence across these different groups. Um, and so I want to just draw your attention to when we're talking about communities of practice. Um, so from the literature, there's Teaching Tech Together is a great book by um, one of the founders of The Carpentries. I really you know, recommend um, taking a look at. And so communities of practice are people bound together by interest in an activity such as knitting or particle physics. And one really key piece here that I think um, I, I always want to highlight is this idea of legitimate peripheral participation. So this is this idea that um, that you can be part of this community, can become part of this community, not just by sprinting in and being like, ah, yes, I too can do exactly what this person up here is doing. I am the same. Because honestly, that can be very difficult and demotivating. Um, you know, instead, these communities tend to work really well when they can help people um, who are maybe tentatively walking into the space meaningfully participate. So in this example, it's saying that maybe you're not um, you know, you're not immediately directing this project, but you're you're starting, you're participating, you're making your first scarf, you're stuffing envelopes, you're proofreading documentation. That's huge. And I think that this is a really helpful reminder for how it feels when we're new to these communities that we really love and care about is that giving people a route to meaningfully participate. Um, the other piece is something that I really appreciate uh, from the Arcus education team, um, kind of the mission statement we really focus in on um, this model of learner instructor. And so from a mission statement, we try to focus on creating opportunities for community members to develop as learner instructors who learn, teach, uh, coach, and mentor their colleagues and community. So we understand that pretty much 
all of us have experience with being the learner and being the instructor. And we kind of reject the idea that there should be any divides at all. Um, this is another way that we kind of think in about, you know, we have these extant communities, these different communities of practice, but just as we want to make sure that newcomers can come and not feel like this is cool, but this isn't me, at the same time, we have we can we can kind of grow and think about our communities as being spaces where everyone, uh, no matter where you're at, can lead and teach others. Everyone has something to share. So that's an important kind of idea for us. Um, and so, of course, uh, the next you know half of this, I'll talk a bit about what it was like, uh, you know, once COVID had hit. Um, you know, we basically being at uh, at this you know research institute as part of a hospital, of course, like basically shut down of anything that wasn't essential work being in person. So a lot of the research institute went remote. Um, you know, there's large distinction. Um, if you weren't, if you didn't need to be there, you know, you weren't physically on site. Now this created a really important impact uh, where people were basically, who might've had projects on site or research that was not essential, but very important, uh, were basically sidelined for a while because they couldn't get into their physical resources or experiments. And so there was a real um, surge of people who were all of a sudden in this kind of precarious position of uh, not really knowing how to spend this time. And so uh, our fearless leader, uh, who you'll hear from next, uh, Joy Payton, had the, the, the great idea to be, raise her hand and be like, well, why don't, we, why don't we do some education? Why don't we hold this webinar series? Uh, we'll call it Lab Down, Skill Up. So we'll basically create a rapid, wide-scale data science training program. And let's just start it in, I can't remember if it was one day or two days later. And so we basically agreed to teach three webinars a day. And this is what our spring into summer looked like. It was wild. We taught over 130 sessions. And when I say we taught, I actually mean going back to learner instructors that we facilitated um, you know, this process where, uh, where 31 of our, uh, ourselves and our colleagues, largely um, technical folks who may or may not have had um, backgrounds as educators, were the ones up there leading these sessions. And we also really committed to this regular cadence. You can see about halfway through, we really, we took a break for a couple of weeks and slowed down and we went a little bit more reasonably, Monday to Thursday, two times a day. Um, but we also, you know, we, we noticed that people were indeed um, coming a lot and coming back because uh, there was this element of familiarity and structure and this personal element that people really connected to. So we were doing stuff. And I think that the critical moment came for us a couple weeks in when people were coming and having this, this seemingly positive experience. And also we realized this is a huge opportunity to understand what people are going through now, but in general, what is the state of data learning and data needs at our institution? Like how do we go from this massive activity to, um, to learning about what it's like to, to, to learn here? So we said, let's slow down, let's take a couple of weeks and let's, um, let's ask people, you know, let's, let's conduct some research. So, and this is kind of what one unit looked like. Um, you know, Jake Riley was leading a session here on intermediate data visualization. Um, we created content that we can use later. Um, and these are some of the statistics um, about you know, attending. And I will just keep going and talk a little bit about evaluation for the remainder here. So um, the key piece is here. Uh, we used mixed methods research. Uh, we were able, I'm realizing, I wanna make sure to have time for everything. So we basically uh, had surveys, we had user interviews. Um, we ended up looking at who was there and we noticed that it wasn't just data analysts or it wasn't just you know one role. It was actually this really interesting mix of people who had already identified that they were, they had basically data in their role, they were analysts to also people who are like sitting as managers, as coordinators, as administrators. So we were reaching people who, um, we didn't necessarily have the PIs in the room. We had a lot of people who were um, starting their careers at CHOP or figuring out how they fit into things. And that became really, really important. Um, so uh, as we looked at this, we learned that people really responded to the welcoming atmosphere here. So this was really something people, more than anything else, they responded to the instructors as people up there, you know, and that was really neat to see that people wanted this sort of experience. They want, there was this emotional element that was really important at the time. Um, we also learned that people really wanted more guidance and sequencing, which was a very key actionable insight. When we think about kind of tactics, we realized that we needed to give more description, more context so people could move through this. So we had this emotional element and we, uh, in terms of, you know, being a reliable community space, 
but we also wanted to make sure to structure the content so it was accessible. So these are things we're learning from the surveys. But maybe one of the newer things that we realized was that the social context here was absolutely key because uh, what was happening was that people were not just not just taking information as end users, but trying to you know figure out within their units, within their part of this institution, kind of what it meant to learn and grow. And so we had people, and, and it wasn't always the same answer. You know, we had folks from program managers talking about the need to create trainings for groups of people. It wasn't enough just to assume people had the buddy, right? So we couldn't just assume that people already just know a person. We needed to be explicit about creating these opportunities. But then we also had folks who were ready to go, perhaps interested in joining these bigger groups, like some of the user groups, and they knew that these were positive experiences, but they were just intimidated by that and they felt much more comfortable by having that buddy. So if you have the buddy, it's great, but if you don't have the buddy, what do you do? How do you make this all work? Um, we also found out that a lot of people really needed to convince their supervisors of value. And so I love this idea here, which is that um, you know somebody in an interview said that, uh, the boss said that if I had the magic button, that would be great, and so I made the magic button. So in this case, something like dashboard reporting was key to convincing the value here of what's going on. So um, what I wanna just leave you with here is this idea that, um, you know, when we think about communities of practice, right, think about, this actually goes really well with the, um, the NHSR idea of uh, going from the flat communities, non-hierarchical, to actually understanding the hierarchies, or I'll even just say the networks across communities. Because when we think about supporting people, uh, we might want to also imagine the idea of a network. And this kind of sets our future research agenda. This is something we're working towards, um, is that we want to think about how influence plays out within a network. So this is a network visualization with nodes that are connected here. Um, and, you know, and so when we think about things like influence across a community, we can think about ties within a community, communities becoming more intermeshed. This is something from Washington University. Um, but we can also think here about, uh, you know, if we wanna grow communities, how are those communities actually structured? You know, is a network graph a useful metaphor here? So we think about um, how to support people, how to help them step up and how to create materials so that for like the nodes within the network so that we can actually help people get protected time. We can help people who don't know the person reach out to and especially the folks who might not, you know, share some of the same normative identities, the same access, the same power within an institution, um, you know, folks who are, who are coming into um, a research context and they're ready to learn, but they just don't have that access or, you know, yet. Um, we can help create that by being strategic about what we learn about communities. Um, so um, I, this is really a, I would love to see more of this type of work and I'm a mixed methods person. So I will always love the idea of the network. That's something that just calls out to me, but I think it provides a nice layer of complication because we work in really complex institutions. So how can we kind of think about going from from communities here to and these great opportunities like webinars and events to really advocating for people's growth and movement within these networks. So I got a little rushed there. I, uh, I apologize there, but I am really excited to share this because I believe a lot in strategy. This is how I'm growing a lot personally within my work in data is finding ways to celebrate vulnerability, kind of having mental models that work for understanding influence, and then um, you know, creating these meshes of communities of practice. And then finally, never forgetting about what it's like to be a newcomer and making sure that there are meaningful ways to participate as newcomers. So those are some of the ideas. I would love to hear any questions. And here's my cat and I reunited in the end. So. So I think we've got time for uh, one brief question, yes. and the, the top one was, you know, how do you keep people engaged when you're doing these presentations virtually? Oh, it's it's a wonderful question. I think going back to our instructor kind of toolkit is meaningful participation, not putting people on the spot to have to share their video necessarily. Um, but I think, cause we're all kind of fatigued, right? Except me, hi. Um, but I think really having meaningful ways to ask people questions in the chat to, I love having people predict. That's one of my favorite tools here. Um, you know, being like, why might something break? The kind of Socratic method. 
and uh, and just making sure that there's meaning that people feel really included uh, in meaningful ways. And you can even be strategic and be like at the beginning, at the middle, at the end. I want to make sure to have asked enough questions that people can jump into. I love I love chat for that personally. Um, yeah. Yeah, this has been really great. Um, <laughs> Got some good ideas here I have to think about some of those too. And um, we're going to then, I think, switch to the next session. Perfect. Sorry, right, thank people. you, everyone. Yeah.